Okay. So uh, I will upload my writing pad and we will move forward. In the previous uh, class, <clears throat> we were discussing about different characteristics of turbulent flow. And one of the characteristics we understood as a widely varying range of length scales and time scales. The length scales varied all the way from the system length scale down to a length scale which may even approach the molecular length scale and that we obtained as a length scale known as Whole number of length scales. There is some noise coming from uh, somebody's uh, system. Maybe unmuted uh, system will uh, is creating problems. So please mute your uh, systems. Okay, thank you. So uh, other than the wide range of length scales. One of the major implications of turbulent flow is a very unique vorticity dynamics. So I will first talk about very briefly vorticity dynamics in general. And then specifically how it matters so far as the physics of turbulent flow is concerned. So the first few uh, concepts that I will talk about in the perspective of vorticity dynamics are something which are valid both uh, for laminar, turbulent, or as a matter of fact, any kind of flow. But where it is very special for turbulent flow, that I will talk about. So first of all, what do we mean by vorticity dynamics? By vorticity dynamics, we mean that just like how velocity varies with time, this intends to give an idea of how Vorticity varies with time. So to do that, we'll start with uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. So as an example, let us take incompressible flow. Similar concepts are valid for compressible flow as well, not that they are invalid, but uh, it will include a bit more additional effects which uh, are not in the focus of the dynamics of vorticity that we are going to talk about here. So I'm writing the Navier-Stokes equation with uh, incompressible flow into consideration. So this is uh, the vector form of the Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, we are starting with that because that is not dependent on any coordinate system. Now, what we will do is, uh, we, our objective is very straightforward. We'll try to express 
all these in terms of the vorticity which in the fluid kinematics chapter we define as the curl of the velocity so now we will start with the this description of the term which is the so called convective term and this term is very very important because this adds non linearity to the flow we have earlier seen that if this term is not there uh, and there is no non linearity in some body force uh, i mean we can add the body force if there is no such non linearity in the body force then if this term is not there it is a linear system so the non linearity comes because of this but uh, before uh, looking into that aspect we will use this vector identity to simplify this term uh, rather i mean i would not say simplify it is already simplified in a way to or in a path to express everything in terms of vorticity so uh, the first signature of vorticity comes here which is the curl of velocity and uh, you may recall that this is a vector identity which we used in the context of deriving the bernoulli's equation if you recall the dynamics of inviscid flow chapter so uh, the same thing we are doing uh, we will substitute this term in terms of the identity which will lead to now the uh, most important step that we will do that we have written uh, some of the term in terms of vorticity true but all other terms are expressed in terms of velocity so what we will do is we will take curl of both sides knowing well that curl of the velocity will give us vorticity so if we take curl of both sides uh, of this equation uh, what comes out is uh, first of all we have to recognize that curl includes spatial derivative that is derivative with respect to space it doesn't have any conflict of derivative that is calculated with respect to time in that way we will uh, separate the time uh, derivative here and just take curl of v so that this becomes the time derivative of vorticity plus we will uh, take curl of this one then curl of v cross this curl of grad e plus mu so the laplacian also you can use as a separate operator and curl of v becomes vorticity there are two obvious simplifications here out of uh, standard vector calculus identity so this is a grad of uh, this 
B dot P. And this is curl. So curl of grad of any function, scalar function, that uh, as per vector identity, curl of grad of a uh, say scalar function. Grad is always uh, on a scalar function. So here it's a scalar function because v dot v is v square. So curl of grad of a scalar function is a null vector. So that means uh, not only uh, this term, which is a curl of grad of this, this is also curl of grad of uh, the scalar function pressure. So both are null vectors. And in a way, uh, the objective that is fulfilled here is that because pressure is a parameter which doesn't have a separate governing equation. So this is one way of eliminating pressure from the Navier-Stokes equation so that it doesn't directly appear here and one can construct using the continuity and the Navier-Stokes equation a separate governing equation for pressure. Now, uh, what we will do is we will now simplify this term, which is uh, a term that involves both velocity and vorticity. So for this also, we will use a vector identity that curl of the cross product of two vectors. So this vector identity So this is simply a vector identity that I am writing and I'm just writing by looking into the notebook, not that I'm writing this from my memory. So you are not required to write this from your memory, but we will discuss more how we can make use of this vector identity for understanding the vorticity dynamics in general and its specific implications on turbulent flow. First of all, uh, if you see now uh, you know, various terms in the uh, this one, so uh, the vorticity is the curl of velocity. So here you have this, this term, divergence of curl of this, some vector here the vector is vorticity and this is again uh, zero by a very standard vector identity. There is another very uh, important implication here that because it is incompressible flow this is zero. Therefore we are left with two terms in this simplification. One is this one and the other is uh, this one. To uh, proceed forward, we will include those simplifications and write a further modified form of the vorticity equation, the governing equation for vorticity.
So, uh, first of all, uh, this term is there. Second term, this is uh, zero because of the vector identity, I mean null vector. The third term is decomposed into two parts. So, I'm writing the second part first. Remember, we have made only one assumption that it is incompressible flow. Of course, we have neglected or we have not considered any body force because body force, I mean, it can be widely varying uh, in nature. It could be, for example, uh, due to electric field, magnetic field, gravity field, so many other field effects, and it is not possible to generalize each of these. So we have considered a typical case where it is uh, maybe just as an example, a pressure driven flow. So, uh, if we uh, now just write it uh, with uh, a little bit of reorganization of this term, uh, uh, this term which is marked here. So if you see uh, this particular equation, mathematically, it looks like the Navier-Stokes equation where the velocity is replaced by vorticity. So this is just like you can write uh, the total derivative of vorticity. So Navier-Stokes equation talks about total derivative of velocity. Here, instead, we are talking about the total derivative of vorticity. So the total derivative of vorticity is related to, so this is again, uh, just like viscous term in the Navier-Stokes equation, this is a viscous term in the vorticity equation. So this is a, a viscous dissipation of vorticity. And this one is a special term in the vorticity equation and it appears to be like a body force like term which would have appeared in a navier stokes equation so we will just uh, call it a simple source term uh, in in this equation which we can generally say vorticity transport equation that means uh, just like velocity its equation uh, that governs velocity is the momentum transport equation. This is vorticity transport equation. So, with this particular equation, where the other terms are similar in uh, structure or form, just like the Navier-Stokes equation. We will now make a quest to figure out what is the physical implication of this source term. The mathematical equations that I have put forward so far are valid equally for laminar and turbulent flow. But for turbulent flow, this source term has a very, very important and special implication. And that we will now pinpoint through our discussion on vorticity dynamics or vorticity transport for turbulent flows. where we will try to uh, 
figure out that for turbulent flows, uh, I mean, what could this lead to? The discussion on turbulent flows, of course, the natural way could be to go through this differential equation, but I would like to prefer to relate this with a simple physics based or physical phenomena based understanding rather than going through just a differential equation. So we will um, recall that for turbulent flow, you have eddies of different length scales. We have a large eddy, I mean, uh, a type of eddy called as large eddy, which extracts kinetic energy from the mean flow that we have earlier uh, talked about, that there is a flow and large eddy it is a uh, size of uh, the system. It is. It can be as large as the system's size. It will take uh, kinetic energy from the mean flow. And uh, it will start rotating because it is a lump of rotating fluid element. And the rotation is very, very critical here because this vorticity talks all about rotation. So it is rotating with an angular velocity omega. And we know that angular velocity uh, in, in definition terms is half, just half of the vorticity. So physically, it, uh, it is very similar. We have to remember that uh, by the phenomenon of energy cascading, the energy, the kinetic energy here is transferred from the large to progressively smaller eddies, progressively smaller ones till you reach the Kolmogorov length scale because that is where the energy is dissipated. So let us say I'm just giving a schematic view with you know, nothing you know, related to exactly the real uh, you know, diagram. So let us say you have a smaller eddy like this. So the large eddy, what it is doing, it is when it is transferring the kinetic energy to the smaller eddy and it has to do it otherwise the smaller eddy will not, uh, it is something like the viscous effect of the wall. So smaller eddy is not directly extracting kinetic energy from the wall. So what it is all doing is it is interacting with the larger eddies. So in that way, this smaller eddy will also start rotating or keep on rotating. So when the part of the kinetic energy, let us say, let us imagine a situation that in some snapshot of time, there was no question of this smaller eddy. That means the large eddy would have had its own uh, kinetic energy. But as soon as this uh, smaller eddy and its sustaining motion comes into consideration, it simply leads to a condition that the large eddy will share some of its kinetic energy with the smaller eddy. So if it shares its kinetic energy with the smaller eddy, so far as the angular speed of the large eddy is concerned, it will go down. So it will go down with an understanding in this way, what will happen to the geometric configuration of the large eddy? This is what we will see more carefully. So if you recall that one of the hallmarks of turbulent flow is inertia force much, much greater than viscous force. 
over the system scales because the Reynolds number over the system scale is large. So when you have inertia force much, much greater than viscous force over the system scale, the large AD is also having the dimension of the system scale. So the dimension of the large AD is just almost like the diameter of the pipe in which the fluid is flowing. So if you have the large AD with respect to its length scale, we can say that the inertia force is much, much greater than the viscous force. Therefore, uh, we can assume that viscous force is negligible for large AD, not, not for all scales, but for large AD at least. So if the viscous force is negligible, then in an inertia governed system where viscous force is negligible, there is no viscous dissipation. So we can conclude from this physical discussion that negligible viscous dissipation is there for uh, large AD. So if negligible viscous dissipation is there for large AD, we can say that angular momentum is conserved. We can uh, summarily say that uh, just like rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the force by Newton's second law, an equivalent representation for angular motion is the rate of change of angular momentum is equal to the torque. Physically, it should be like that. If the rate of change of linear momentum is related or equal to the force, rate of change of angular momentum is related to the torque, where I is the moment of inertia. So in this case, our focus is the large eddy. So once you have this torque and uh, you have uh, this viscous torque uh, in this case. So in this case, what can be the torque? You are not applying any uh, rotational effect external to the flow. All torque is there because of what are the physical phenomena inside the flow. And one of the critical physical phenomena inside the flow is the viscous interaction. And the viscous interaction will naturally give a torque. Uh, I will give a completely different analogy to explain that why viscous interaction is so much related to torque rotation like that. Let us imagine, uh, of course, nowadays uh, people do not uh, use or people are not using that much of a crowded uh, public vehicle uh, because of the pandemic. But in a densely populated country like India, uh, in a very crowded public vehicle, say a bus, it is moving, and there is a passenger who wants to come out of the bus uh, near a bus stop. Now, if uh, so, we have seen uh, in our common experience in the road that in the act of say coming down at the location of choice where the bus will not exactly stop some passenger may even have a tendency to jump out of the bus but not jump out uh, just arbitrarily jump out in an act of safeguarding against falling down. If you have observed such a passenger, the passenger 
we simply jump out of the bus and keep on running in the direction in which the bus was moving. What is the reason? The bus is moving with a certain velocity and once the passenger comes out of the bus, the passenger, if not aided by any other velocity, will be forced to a standstill by the ground, by the road, which is at standstill and the feet is uh, and the feet are you know in contact with the ground and in that way there is a tendency from a motion that was being imparted by the bus to come to a sudden standstill and if that tendency is uh, is somehow uh, you know not uh, circumvented by some additional measure, the passenger will have a tendency to fall or uh, topple because of this, uh, you know, feet on the ground which is stationary and the body was moving, so body will still uh, try to move forward and in that way uh, it will create a rotational tendency and the passenger will fall. So what the passenger does is to make sure that, uh, you know, the leg also, uh, you know, even if it is not a high speed run, so it's a bit of a jog forward so that this toppling tendency is gone. So the effect of the solid boundary in this case has created a velocity gradient and that velocity gradient has created a vorticity or here is we do not call it a vorticity, simply rotation of the passenger or toppling of the passenger. For fluid flow, imagine a situation that you have a solid boundary so the fluid is uh, at standstill here and the fluid is moving with some non-zero velocity. So there is a velocity variation. And in that way, there is a variation of velocity with respect to the Y coordinate. So you have the curl of the velocity, which uh, comes into picture because of the variation of velocity with the y coordinate and that gives rise to the vorticity. So in this case, uh, you have a torque in, in such an example, which is there in, 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 in say a pipe flow, a flow through a pipe where we are having turbulent flow. So this torque will be viscous torque, that is the torque due to the Viscous, internal viscous effects. Not really you have applied any torque. But in the large AD scale, uh, you have negligible viscous dissipation. So this is, uh, this viscous torque is negligible. So that means if that is negligible, the angular momentum is conserved. So I have written total derivative because we, will ex we are expressing it in terms of the Eulerian variables. So total derivative is important here, but otherwise you know, forget about what kind of derivative. We can qualitatively say that angular momentum, this is conserved for large area, not for all, everything, conserved for large area, approximately conserved, may not be exactly. So what it means is that if you have a reduction in omega, which is happening due to energy cascading, because uh, the large eddy is giving away its energy. So for a reduction in omega, you will have an increase in I so that the product I into omega is conserved. So increase in I, how is it possible? You cannot really uh, increase the uh, this lateral dimension of the large eddy even further. It is already the system length scale. So what it can do is something which was of this uh, nearly circular shape, it will stretch so that this length scale, which was earlier circular and you know, nearly circular, this has got stretched, which will make sure that the radius of gyration is more of this lump, which is the AD, and hence I is more. So in the way, the individual vortex elements, which are these eddies, but we can call these as vortex elements, so we can clearly see that physically they will stretch. 
and by the stretching there will be more and more interaction with such eddies because by stretching its range of action uh, will be uh, enhanced will be uh, the span will be more and uh, that is how uh, this vortex stretching so we will call it vortex stretching i will write it uh, separately so this vortex stretching is a very important aspect of turbulent flow and it continues till you know you you reach uh, down the kolmogorov of linsky now when you have a vortex stretching in a large eddy scale so vortex stretching for large eddy let us take an example vortex stretching for large eddy so we have understood it qualitatively we will now just write a simple differential equation so this will be i d omega dt plus omega di dt uh is equal to zero for small eddy this zero will be replaced by the viscous torque i mean not small the smaller i mean the ones for which the viscous effects are important remember this equation is valid for all i mean it doesn't specifically relate to large or small eddy but we can say that this what this viscous effect will not be there for small eddy so the uh, if you have this i d omega dt it is relate it is just equal to minus omega di dt now you compare this equation with the vorticity transport equation so this box term is equivalent to this here it's a uh derivative of vorticity it is angular velocity and physically similar right hand side uh viscous effect is not there for large eddy so this source term for which we were in the quest of physics that where from it comes we can get an answer from here that this all originated because of vortex stretching and this is like a source of vorticity so we can say that uh, this source term is a vorticity source due to vortex stretching for turbulent flow and its physical meaning is very much similar to the uh, angular velocity or vorticity times the rate of change of moment of inertia so to summarize the discussion so far where we have primarily uh, been restrictive to physically based discussion we have talked about two important features of uh this vorticity and energy transport in turbulent flow one is vortex stretching another is energy cascading and we have discussed physically about these two and these physical features give rise to unique properties of turbulent flow which if you leave aside the mathematical factors if you just do experiments you will uh, 
get to know from the graphs that you get out of the experiments. Let us say that we are doing an experiment where we are measuring the velocity as a function of time. So we have to remember one thing that because of such random fluctuations, complex phenomena like vortex stretching, energy cascading, etc., you cannot really have one dimensional flow or steady flow. Either of these concepts in turbulent flow. So turbulent flow by nature is 3D and unsteady. There is no, uh, no simplicity that will inherently uh, speculate that no, this is one dimensional steady, etc. You have all these things you know, varying with time. So time is a very critical factor. And because of such fluctuations, definitely uh, you know, one dimensional velocity is not going to work. So I'm giving you two examples of two different experiments on turbulent flow. And you will clearly see uh, you, know, uh, or you will be able to clearly make out the differences if you uh, just look into the graph of this velocity versus time. Says so from some experiment, these graphs are obtained. So one uh, graph is uh, something like this. I'm just drawing it arbitrarily to give a concept, not that I'm trying to draw any specific experiment or depict any specific experiment. So this is a say experiment uh, one or oh, sorry experiment two. This is the second experiment that we have drawn and the green one is experiment. One. So the first uh, sorry experiment one. So the first thing that we can observe out of this is that there are small scale uh, fluctuations. So you have a characteristic time over which the thing is evolving. So let us say that it is hours or minutes, but in a small, very small time scale, maybe say millisecond or whatever, there is a fluctuation. To understand how it evolves over the system, it is therefore uh, often a practical approach to consider averaging this data. Averaging means that we do not really uh, keep in mind always this you know small small fluctuations in the local scale. So if we average that out over the global scale. So this is perhaps the global scale, uh, you know, on an average you can get for this experiment too. Whereas for experiment one, you may get you know, something like this. So these red lines are averages. I will show you formally how these averages are defined. But before that, we can clearly see a difference. What is that difference? The difference is that if you average in this way, the averaged value of u in experiment two appears to be almost steady. It is not changing with time. And for experiment one, it is changing with time. So it is a steady like behavior. And uh, this we can say something we cannot call steady turbulence, although I mean somebody may use that terminology, but a bit of a misnomer. So we can say stationary turbulence. In a way, that not the it is not that the phenomena is time independent, but if you average it in this way, the average parameter, say the average parameter we call as u bar, that is time independent. But in this case, uh, you have this. Uh, average also unsteady, the experiment. 
so one of the lessons that we get out of this experiment uh, uh, analysis maybe model experiment analysis is that it may be possible so you have the turbulent flow velocity u you decompose it into two parts which is a average u which is this red line along with some fluctuations the fluctuations are you know local functions average is i mean it may be constant but it may also evolve with time so average itself may evolve with time but the time scale of evolution of the average is much much larger as compared to the very small time scale fluctuations so this in this way it may be possible to decompose the you know, turbulent flow parameters in terms of uh, expressions where you have a mean representation and a fluctuation on the top of the mean to represent two different scale effects one over the system evolution and another very small scale fluctuations so this is true for u it could be valid for velocity uh, component v and w and also for pressure so any variable it could be even temperature in a heat transfer problem in a turbulent flow so in general we can talk about a decomposition of any of the dependent variables the dependent function f in the turbulent flow function or variable f is f bar plus f prime so this is known as reynolds decomposition so reynolds put forward this decomposition technique and the way in which uh, this averaging was defined is something like this so in this case uh, it is averaging over time but you can do similar experiment i'm just drawing another experiment just to show that how similar variations can be uh, analyzed over space so this is u versus time at a given x x means uh, position vector so similarly you have u versus x this graph also you can obtain for a given time so you can get even a uh, very similar uh, fluctuations whatever whatever you are getting so at a given position you could uh, see how it changes with time or at a given time you could see how it changes with position so for averaging this averaging we have to remember that it could be either time average or space average so this is time average or space average depending on what is that uh, variation that you are considering so for the example of time average for time average how do you define it so average means uh, basically you uh, i mean if you are considering it as a continuous function you have to integrate over that so it is just like summation but in a continuous domain summation replaces integration uh this is integrated over a time t so say from time equal to 0 you start counting you can say from t1 to t2 over a span of capital t but it is easy to consider that you start with time equal to 0 and end up with a time equal to capital t and then just like averaging you divide it by the total time span capital t but in the limit as t tends to infinity so as soon as i say that in the limit as it tends to infinity i mean one will uh, immediately jump on this definition and say that well uh, 
what is the question of infinity here so here you have to understand just like several other physical problems we have discussed earlier that there is some uh, uh, sort of uh, conceptual uh, you know subtle aspect that you have to consider when you consider a mathematical infinity applied to a physical problem so what this all says is that it is not literally infinity but much larger than the very you know small time scale fluctuations but not definitely over this entire so if for example experiment 1 we have averaged over this entire time then you lose this variation so you have to say to get this red line you have to average it over a time which may be uh, you know uh, not as large as this one but not as small as this fluctuation so it should be ideally a few orders larger than the fluctuation so that with respect to the fluctuation time it is like infinity not infinity in a literal sense now what we will do is we will decompose f into two parts this reynolds decomposition just use the definition of reynolds decomposition and take the uh, this limit etc so if we tend to do that this is equal to limit as t tends to infinity f bar dt and now this is a this is with respect to this capital t this f bar is a constant that is why it's an average so we can take f bar out of the average and then uh, divide by t plus limit as t tends to infinity 1 by t integral of f dash dt 0 So now look at the first term in the right hand side. This is simply capital T, and that will be cancelled with this. So from this we can come to the equation f bar is equal to f bar plus the average of f prime. This is nothing but the average of f prime, f prime bar. so this tells that average of a fluctuation is zero so any fluctuation its average will be zero we have to keep in mind certain rules of this uh, decomposition which we got out of uh, this simple calculation that although uh, if bar a uh, sorry if uh, fluctuation bar that is zero so we say that this is zero but fluctuation of f with another fluctuation g may be two different variables say velocity u its fluctuation multiplied with this one or velocity u multiplied with you know the fluctuation of u itself now if you take an average of that these are not zero because uh if you just substitute in place of f f into g and uh, break it into two parts this kind of identity will not come physically if you have a fluctuation in x component of velocity if you have a fluctuation in y component of velocity their interaction on an average will not be equal to zero so in fact uh, this uh, this as a specific example this is related to the root mean square so this is mean square of uh, uh, so you take the u u fluctuation square and although 
average of u fluctuation is zero because there will be some positive, some negative altogether zero. But if you take squares of that and then simply add uh, the, the experimental data and you know take the average, that will not be zero because these are all positive numbers. Uh, so this is about averaging and just that we did time averaging. Similarly, you could do space averaging, just replace time with space. In terms of the attributes of this particular type of flow, because you know statistically uh, it may be convenient to represent it, we will discuss about two aspects. One is homogeneous turbulence. So homogeneous turbulence, from the name it is clear, we have talked about the homogeneous uh, turbulence. Uh, so homogeneous turbulence means that turbulent statistics are invariant. to translation of coordinate axis. So uh, what it means is that if you are having uh, some turbulent statistics somewhere, if you translate the coordinate axis, what will happen? You go to a new position. And at that new position, the statistical representation is the same. Not that the phenomenon is exactly uh, duplicated, but statistically it is similar. So, and uh, because of this uh, you know, position independent issue, it is called as homogeneous. But the statistics of turbulence, not really the exact what is happening. Similarly, uh, isotropic turbulence is a terminology. that talks about turbulent statistics uh, that will be direction independent. So turbulent statistics are independent of, you know, invariant to all those types of transformations. To um, say rotation, reflection, translation, translation of coordinate axis. So that means by uh, definition, we can say that if we have isotropic turbulence, that is a much stronger case than homogeneous turbulence because the translation and invariance which is required for homogeneous is already inbuilt also in isotropic. So we can say that isotropic turbulence must be uh, isotropic. This is the definition. So isotropic turbulence must be homogeneous. OK. So when isotropic turbulence must be homogeneous. Uh, we can, of course, uh, this is ISO, so I means that. So uh, that means that uh, it is possible to uh, make certain special cases by considering homogeneous and possibly isotropic turbulence. We have uh, touched upon very briefly about a terminology called a stationary turbulence. So all of what it means, stationary turbulence, we have uh, shown the example of experiment two in one of the graphs, that is the stationary turbulence. That means 
the uh, you know on an average it is not changing with time that is what in very very simple words we can say so if you do if you repeat your experiments over time and make a time average the time average because the statistics is not varying with time whatever average is happening over time is as good as just making a number of uh, you know repeat experiments if we say repeat experiments and make an average of it so if you repeat experiments then for a stationary turbulence the repeat experiments um, you know as uh, you know the repeats are as good as uh, time average and we can therefore say that time average equal to so if you do repeat experiments that is called as ensemble average and uh, this repeat experiment we are entitled to repeat over time because on an average we know that it is a stationary turbulence it will not on an average change with time for homogeneous turbulence you know as a very special case translation of coordinate is with respect to position so space average is equal to ensemble ensemble average means repeat ex ex average over repeat experiments so now if you do a space average where you you have uh, homogeneous turbulence so then what will happen so if you have space average over a homogeneous turbulent phenomenon with respect to space you do not expect any change of the turbulent statistics so at different locations if you make your measurement and call it your experimental average or ensemble average that is also okay because with respect to position average will not change so if both are satisfied that is if you have both stationary and homogeneous turbulence that is for homogeneous and stationary turbulence when both are satisfied then you have ensemble average equal to time average equal to space average so time average equal to space average equal to ensemble average and there are large number of uh, practical cases uh, where it can be approximated as homogeneous and stationary and therefore when we say averaging from our next uh, lecture onwards we may either say time average or space average but all in all that will lead to the same you know experimental average you know repeat experiment average which we call as uh, ensemble average so this is a very important uh, well you cannot really prove it but by this physical understanding we can recognize it and infer it so this is known as ergodic hypothesis in statistical mechanics a very important hypothesis in statistical mechanics this is called as ergodic hypothesis so with this let us uh, stop the lecture today i just want to remind you that on saturday this coming saturday at 11 am we'll have the uh, class test and uh, our uh, lecture classes uh, continuation of the turbulent flow discussion will uh, be there in the next week we will continue with this discussion on the coming monday so uh, thank you very much and uh, we will uh, have the test on the coming saturday